Today, we're stretching into one of the most overlooked yet incredibly useful inventions ever. The rubber band. Tiny, simple, and often sitting forgotten in a drawer until you need one, rubber bands are everywhere. But have you ever stopped to wonder, how exactly are these stretchy little loops made? And why do they snap sometimes when you least expect it? Stick around, because later in this video we'll bust some common myths about rubber bands and uncover a few fun facts that might surprise you. Before we dive into the factory floor, let's rewind and look at the history. The story of rubber itself goes back thousands of years. Ancient civilizations in Central and South America, like the Mayans and Aztecs, discovered natural rubber from the sap of the rubber tree. They used it to waterproof clothing, make containers, and craft bouncy balls for ceremonial games. Back then, it was sticky, fragile, and melted in the heat. Useful, but limited. Everything changed in 1839, when Charles Goodyear stumbled upon vulcanization, heating rubber with sulfur. This transformed sticky sap into a durable, elastic material. Suddenly, rubber could stretch and return to its shape without falling apart. Six years later, in 1845, Stephen Perry in England patented the rubber band, cutting strips from vulcanized rubber tubes. At first, they were mainly used in offices to hold papers together. But soon, people found uses for them in households, schools, and even in farming. By the late 1800s, rubber bands were everywhere. During World War II, rubber became so essential that governments rationed it. Rubber bands were prized for holding gear, supplies, and communications cables together. After the war, synthetic rubbers were developed, making bands even more durable and less dependent on natural rubber trees. And speaking of things you can't live without, here's a quick stretch break. Go ahead and stretch that like button, snap the subscribe, and loop the notification bell around your finger so you don't miss a single behind-the-scenes reveal from the How-To Factory. Now let's head into the factory. Rubber bands begin their life with natural latex harvested from rubber trees, mostly in Southeast Asia. Workers tap the trees carefully, carving thin grooves in the bark. This doesn't kill the tree. Instead, milky white latex sap slowly drips into collection cups. That liquid is filtered, treated with formic acid to help it solidify, and rolled into sheets. These sheets are pressed into blocks, dried, and shipped off to factories worldwide. At the factory, the rubber is shredded and milled. It passes through heavy rollers that warm and soften it. At this stage, chemicals like sulfur, accelerators, pigments, and sometimes synthetic rubbers are blended in. The mixture looks a lot like thick cookie dough, but stickier. This blend is crucial. It determines the strength, color, and flexibility of the final product. Next comes vulcanization, the key to making rubber elastic and tough. The rubber is heated in giant ovens, locking in flexibility and durability. Without this step, your rubber band would crumble, melt, or snap too easily. Once vulcanized, the rubber is shaped into long, hollow tubes by extruding it over steel mandrels. Think of them like metal rods. Imagine coating a spaghetti noodle the size of a telephone pole in rubber, and you'll have the right picture. The rubber-covered mandrels are cured again with heat, which ensures the tubes stay strong and stretchy. When the tubes cool, they're slid off the mandrels, leaving behind giant hollow cylinders of rubber. These cylinders are then moved to slicing machines. With incredible precision, sharp blades cut them into thin rings. The size of each slice determines the size of the band. Thin slices make small, delicate bands for braces or hair ties, while thicker slices make the sturdy ones used to bundle newspapers, hold broccoli stalks together, or even secure airplane cargo. And here's something most people don't realize. Rubber bands aren't just tan. Factories add dyes for all kinds of colorful bands. Fluorescent pink, bright green, even glow-in-the-dark versions exist. Some are designed to resist heat, others to handle cold without snapping. And some are even food-safe so they can touch produce or meat. Here's a fun fact. 
the U.S. Postal Service uses millions of rubber bands every single day. They are one of the largest consumers in the world, bundling letters and packages. And speaking of big numbers, did you know the largest rubber band ball ever made weighed over 9,000 pounds? That's heavier than a car, and it contained more than 700,000 rubber bands. Let's pause for a quick myth buster. Myth number one. Freezing rubber bands makes them last longer. Sounds logical, but it's false. Cold temperatures actually make rubber brittle, so they snap more easily. Storing them in a cool, dry place is better. Myth number two. Thicker rubber bands are stronger. Not always. The strength depends on how far the band can stretch relative to its size. A thin, wide band might actually outperform a thicker one in certain uses. And myth number three, all rubber bands are made from natural rubber. While many still are, especially the biodegradable kinds, lots today use synthetic rubber blends for extra durability. Fun fact, in 2004, a small airplane flew using nothing but a giant rubber band powered engine. It set a record for the longest rubber powered flight. Rubber bands aren't just for office supplies. They can power inventions too. Factories also test rubber bands before shipping them out. Machines stretch and release bands thousands of times to measure durability. They're checked for consistency in size, elasticity, and color. Only the ones that pass inspection make it into the boxes that end up in your desk drawer, junk drawer, or wrapped around your veggies at the grocery store. And here's something cool. Rubber bands are technically biodegradable because they come from natural latex. Left outside, they will break down, though it might take years. That's why you sometimes see cracked, brittle bands on the street. Sunlight and air slowly destroy them. By now, you've probably realized that rubber bands are a lot more than just boring office supplies. They hold our daily lives together, literally. In classrooms, they bundle pencils. In offices, they tame paperwork. On farms, they hold crops. In kitchens, they keep snack bags closed. Engineers and artists have even used them to build sculptures, instruments, and quirky inventions. So the next time you casually reach for one to keep your phone charger coiled or your sandwich bag sealed, remember its journey from a tree in Southeast Asia through a factory of rollers, ovens, and slicing machines and finally into that stretchy little loop in your hand. Rubber bands might be small, but they represent centuries of science, history, and creativity. They're proof that sometimes the simplest objects have the most fascinating backstories. And that's a wrap, or should I say, that's a snap. Thanks for stretching your time with us today. If you enjoyed this peek into how rubber bands are made, Make sure to loop back next time for another behind-the-scenes reveal here at the How-To Factory. Until then, stay curious, stay creative, and never underestimate the power of the simple things.